The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Joining us now is uh, author of Cults Inside and Out, Rick Allen Ross. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Now, uh, before we get into cults himself, how did you get involved in, in writing and deprogramming and, and being so involved in cults yourself? Well, it started a long time ago. In 1982, my grandmother was in a nursing home that was covertly infiltrated by an extreme religious group that targeted the elderly. Uh, they sought jobs on the nursing home staff, and my grandmother was confronted. And when I found out about it, to be honest with you, I was very, very uh, pissed off. So I um, talked to the director of the nursing home, and I became a kind of anti-cult activist community organizer in the 1980s. And that grew into doing intervention work and that led to court expert testimony work, speaking and lecturing, and, um, and and then I wrote the book Cults Inside Out about all of my experiences and many of the cases that I've handled. Now, what do you think? First of all, how, what do we, how do we define a cult? I think you really have to have a very narrow definition. Uh, otherwise, everything becomes a cult. And I think the first distinction to make is there might be a, a group that could be considered a benign cult as opposed to a destructive cult. But a destructive cult has three core characteristics as, as laid out by a psychiatrist, Robert J. Lifton, in the 1980s in a paper he published at Harvard called uh, Cult Formation. The first is an absolute authoritarian leader that becomes an object of worship and is the defining element and driving force of the group. So you've got a David Koresh, a Jim Jones, a Charlie Manson, who is literally a, a, a focus of worship and total submission and obedience to that leader. And then second, the leader uses a kind of intense coercive persuasion and process of manipulation to gain undue influence over the people that follow him or her. And then finally, number three, if it's a destructive cult, the leader exploits and does damage to the people that are followers. And that varies by degree from group to group. Not every group is as bad as another group. So you have some groups that are just ripping people off financially, getting free labor or whatever. And then you have it escalate to where there could be physical violence and abuse, medical neglect, and criminal behavior. So you, work, you, you look for those three characteristics, the leader, the all-powerful leader, the process of coercive persuasion to gain undue influence, and the damage done, and you've got a destructive cult. Now, minus the damage, you might have a group that has an authoritarian leader but is relatively benign. But in my experience, usually uh, power corrupts, and an absolute leader is very much uh, corrupted by that power. So how does one get into such a cult? Like what, Most people, when you say, talk to them, they'll, they say they're too smart. That would never happen to me. I could never be in a cult. And then they look toward people that have been in, and they look down on them, and they say things about them like they're stupid. Well, I think that's shaming and blaming. That's like telling a woman it's your fault that you were raped. Uh, and, and I have to say that in my experience, and I've done about 500 plus interventions all over the world, uh, anybody can get caught up in it given the right set of circumstances. I have deprogrammed five medical doctors, including an anesthesiologist and a surgeon. So they were hardly stupid, and they had money, and they were uh, basically very successful people. What happens is um, you might have a, a bad patch in your life, or there might be somebody in your life that you trust who brings you into this group. And the group is predatory, and it's deceptive, and, and they're not going to tell you, hey, we're a cult. And they're not going to tell you what their hidden agenda is, what's behind uh, the curtain 
And so you get involved on the basis of being tricked, and then you are trapped by the coercive persuasion and the manipulation techniques of the group. And uh, if, I, if I saw any one consistent thread, it would be that a person uh, is going through difficulties, somebody approaches them that they know, that they trust, could be a co-worker, family member, romantic interest, and they say, hey, I've got this great group and, and, or this great church or organization or meditation or martial arts class or whatever. And it could alleviate a lot of your stress, a lot of your anxiety, and it could make, make you a better person. And it has so many answers to life's problems. And if you are at a vulnerable point in your life, and you're dealing with a lot of problems, that can be a very appealing message. So w once someone is, is getting involved, or if you know or see someone that is getting involved in what you think is a cult, what would you recommend uh, to do? Well, in my book, Cults Inside Out, I talk about coping strategies, and what I tell people not to do is tell somebody, hey, you're in a cult, because if you do that, you're going to get their back up, and also they could have handlers, people in the cult that are micromanaging them, that they're texting to and uh, talking to. And those people will say, well, cut that person off. They're a suppressive person. They're negative. Uh, you need to cut them off, disconnect from them. And, uh, and, and so you don't want to be confrontational. You don't want to be excessively critical or argumentative, because if you are, uh, you, you may lose your, your line of communication and your access to that person. And if they're a family member, a spouse, a loved one, you want to keep that communication intact. And so then your strategy is to avoid those negative comments and instead uh, do a deep dive into learning what is a destructive cult and some of the strategies that you might learn and plan to use to help this person that you're concerned about. And, and from the outside looking in, how, how do you assess what is a cult and what isn't? So, you know, because some of these claim to be uh, part of a, you know, Christian or um, like Mormons and, and things like that. So how do, you, how do you get around that, like what a religion is and what a cult is? Well, first of all, all groups called cults are not even spiritually based. Many of them are based on politics, uh, uh, seminars, multi-level marketing, uh, meditation, yoga. Uh, th there could be a, a cult. There was even a cult in Colorado that was based on running. I, I used to call it the running cult. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it could be based on anything. But let's say it's a church and you're worried about that church. What are the checks and balances for power and authority in that particular organization? Is there a democratically elected board that is elected for fixed terms? Uh, is there financial transparency? Is the pastor accountable to the board? Do you know where all the money goes? Uh, is there a legitimate reason to leave? If you say, hey, I don't like this church anymore, I want to go to the church down the street, are they going to tell you you've lost your salvation because you've left the building? Or are they going to say, okay, fine, that's all right. It's all right to leave our, our church. Uh, you are not damned because you leave our particular organization. And I don't want to confuse that with any of the salvation uh, beliefs of Christianity. I'm talking about a church that says, if you don't follow Pastor Smith at 1715 West Central Avenue at this church, you're lost. You cannot go to any other building with any other pastor and have salvation. And that's not a Christian message. That's a, a very controlling, manipulative message that should set up, send up a red flag. So as an amateur, like uh, not being a professional deprogrammer, um, what steps can be taken to keep people from getting involved or to deprogram friends of yours? 
Well, I think, first of all, it's all about education because deprogramming itself is an educational process. It's not therapy. It's not counseling. It's sharing information. So I think uh, we live in the information age where anyone with an electronic device can access the web and do a search and get information about a leader, about an organization. So the most uh, helpful thing often is due diligence. That is uh, really getting in there and diving in through, through searches and finding as much information out about a leader and a group that you can before you make a commitment and get too involved. And uh, another, another thing is to learn about the manipulative techniques of uh, so-called cults. You know, you, you read a book like Cults Inside Out and it takes you through all of the tricks that they play. Every trick they've got pretty much is in, in the book. And there's actually a chapter on assessment, a chapter on, quote, cult brainwashing, end quote. And I put it in quotes because I think that's the pop term. But I would say really what cult brainwashing is in practice is a synthesis of coercive persuasion, thought reform, and influence techniques. It's kind of like we're all vulnerable because, you know, we are all uh, can appreciate advertising, celebrity endorsements, and the persuasion that that uses to pull us in to sell us products and so on. What cults do is a, a very intensified, uh, just like a laser version of that, in which they target people and they manipulate people without their informed consent. And if we want to preempt that, we need to learn all their tricks, and uh, then when, they, when they're coming at us, we can see them clearly. When you worked with the Branch Davidians, specifically the ones prior to, um, was there any indication at the time that what was about what was about to happen with that cult? Well, you know, when I first knew about David Koresh, his name was Vernon Howell. And, you know, he said that he was... Uh, he was the, the the basically the reincarnation of Jesus, and I always used to say, you know, if Jesus is going to come again, is not going to be called Vern. But uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, on a serious note, uh, you know, I had no idea uh, about the the child molestation that was going on in the group. Uh, I did not understand that David Koresh was having sex with with children as young as 10, uh, after the Waco Davidian standoff and the tragedy that, that took all these lives, these people, when Koresh decided to burn the place down rather than surrender, I met uh, uh, Kiri Jewell, who, who was raped by David Koresh when she was 10. Uh, when, when I did the deprogramming interventions, I did one before the standoff with federal authorities, and then I did one actually during the standoff, a, a, a woman who was locked out of the compound who was visiting her family. And when I was doing the first intervention, the group, I, I wasn't aware of how heavily armed the group was until the young man I was working with started talking about all the weapons they had stockpiled and the fact that David Koresh had maxed out his visa card, 5000 bucks was the limit, and all he used it for was to buy bullets. And wow. so I began to realize this was a very heavily armed compound. And though it was a relatively small group, and I have a whole chapter in my book about small but deadly groups like Charlie Manson and the Waco Davidians, uh, even though the group never really had more than maybe 200 people, it was a very dangerous group because they had explosives, they had all kinds of weapons, and Koresh was increasingly, uh, as, as it came down to that standoff with the BATF raid, he was increasingly talking about the end of the world and that Satan was going to attack their compound. It, a lot of cults always degenerate to that sexual uh, power component. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, you know, the most recent group that I have dealt with, which I'm sure you may have heard of through the media, is a group called Nexium. Uh, N-X-I-V-M, pronounced Nexium, like the uh, stomach uh, medication. 
Uh, but anyway, it was led by a man by the name of Keith Ranieri. And I, I met Ranieri and dealt with his victims for many years. In fact, he harassed me personally and sued me, and we went through all kinds of, of, of crap before he was finally arrested. And he was arrested for sex trafficking, racketeering, tax fraud. He's now facing probably life imprisonment. He's right now in a, in a federal holding cell. I testified against him as a fact witness in court in May. And uh, Ranieri took advantage of women, built a, a, a sex slave group in his cult that he called DOS, which was uh, a, a, an acronym for a Latin uh, phrase of, of dominance and submission. And he branded literally women with his initials. He had a, a doctor in the group that was under his influence, and they would use a cauterizing iron and they would engrave his initials in the flesh of women that were his sex slaves uh, on their pelvis. And it was just horrible. I met some of the women who were tortured and were uh, branded. And Ranieri basically, no matter what he got, he had to have more. So he had women that would give him sex, and, and they had to have more, more women give him sex. And then they had to be more and more subservient until finally they had to be slaves and they had to be branded. And so in my experience, there have been a number of, of, of cult leaders who uh, in, uh, are just incredibly demanding and they expect sex on, de on demand, they expect money to be surrendered to them, assets. Uh, Keith Ranieri uh, received uh, over $200 million dollars from heirs to the Seagram's uh, liquor fortune, Claire and her sister Sarah Bronfman, who just kept giving him money, money, money. You know, they were like pinatas. He would hit them and money would come out. And he, no matter how much money he got, and no matter how much sex, he wanted more. And uh, that was finally his undoing, that he could never get enough and that he kept pushing it until finally he pushed his way into being arrested. When you, when you have to, to go to these um, cults or to go to people that have been in them uh, to rescue them or intervent or however you want to call it, how does that happen? Like, What are the steps involved? Well, first of all, a family gets in touch with me. They may email me, call me. Uh, uh, I am the founder and executive director of the Cult Education Institute, which is probably the largest database of information about destructive cults online on the web. It was launched in 1996. It has just thousands and thousands and thousands of documents and articles uh, about hundreds of different groups divided into subsections for people to review the history of these groups. So families find me. Uh, they may have seen me on television. They may have uh, uh, found me through uh, the web. And then they retain me. And I then work with them. They uh, share information with me about the group if I don't already know about the group. I develop a file about the group. And then we plan the intervention, which is by surprise, like a drug or an alcohol intervention. And it typically takes three or four days, and I will meet with the family immediately before the intervention to prep them, prepare them for the intervention. And we as a group, that is typically a spouse, family members, and I, will then meet with the person who is in a destructive group, and we meet with them together. And it's a surprise. Initially, they may be a little bit upset, a little bit angry, but because the family is there and because they care and respect their family, typically they will stay and listen. Again, very similar to a drug or alcohol intervention. And then the intervention proceeds about eight hours a day for three or four days uh, based on the cooperation of that individual and their willingness to talk and stay. And uh, basically we cover four uh, primary uh, things. Number one, uh, we talk about what is a destructive cult. 
and we explore the definition and uh, study what parallels may exist between that definition and the group that they're involved in. And then two, we talk about coercive persuasion, thought reform, influence techniques, and how groups manipulate people. And then three, we talk about the group they're involved in or the leader they're following specifically. What about that leader or group do they not know that they probably should know before continuing on with the group? And then finally, four, we talk about their family and what those concerns are that their family feels uh, prompted the intervention and has brought them to this place. And after we finish talking, it's up to them. Do they stay? Do they continue on, continue on with the group? Or do they decide to leave the group? It's up to them. How hard uh, do these cults or groups um, fight back in a case like that? So if, if you've got someone that you're trying to deprogram, uh, do they try to interrupt that at times? Or um, Definitely. I mean, if they become aware of the intervention effort, they're going to do everything possible to sabotage it. So typically the family will... Um, uh, everyone agrees to disconnect all electronic devices and to take a sabbatical from being online and texting and so on on the basis that the family will typically say to the person, well, look, you've spent a lot of time with this group or following this leader or involved in all of this, and so we're just asking not for equal time but some time, and we don't want the group or leader interfering. So can you make a commitment to not be in communication with uh, that leader, that group, for maybe three days? And and most often the person will say, okay, okay, if it'll make you happy, I'll do it. I'll do it for you, but I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with this group or leader or whatever. And so that will uh, cut the group off from being able to interfere and sabotage the intervention effort. Uh, but in some cases, and I'm successful about three out of the uh, out of four times, uh, but in one out of four, I'm not. And the, the the cases usually fall fall flat and fail in in the first day, and it's because of communication with the group typically, and they the group says, hey, get out of there, leave, don't even talk to your family, forget them, uh, come to us. And so if the group is aware, typically they will sabotage and derail the intervention. Have you ever felt threatened by any of these cults? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've had death threats. I've been stalked. I've been surveilled. I've had my garbage gone through. I've been sued five times by five different uh, cult groups, all of which the lawsuits failed and were dismissed. Keith Ranieri, who I mentioned previously, sued me for 13 years. And if it wasn't for lawyers who work for free, pro bono, because they believed in the, uh, believe in the First Amendment and freedom of speech and they don't like cults, I would uh, not have survived all of that litigation. But fortunately for me, uh, I, there are there are some wonderful organizations like the Berkman Center for Law at Harvard that helped me, or Public Citizen in Washington D.C. that helped me in the Ranieri lawsuit, and then big law firms that have helped me uh, across the country through pro bono, uh, free volunteer work. Uh, so it, yeah, it can be daunting. I mean, these groups, if you're effective and you make a difference in their uh, bottom line and their ability to recruit and make money, they will come after you. And so I have been pursued, harassed, and uh, I mean it's it's been uh, it's been interesting. Uh, it's not a boring career. What do you think the most dangerous cult is right now? Well, I think some of the groups that scare me the most uh, right now are groups that, as a matter of doctrine teach their members that they cannot go to the doctor, they can have no medical care, and keep in mind that their entire families in groups like this, like the General Assembly Church of the Firstborn and the Followers of Christ, which are two prominent faith healing groups in the United States, and they have kids. And when those kids don't get vaccinated, and when those kids don't see a doctor when there's an emergency, they, they die. 
and there have been a number of deaths, there have been a number of parents that have been prosecuted, a number of states that have changed their laws regarding the exclusion of, uh, uh, of responsibility for parents for medical neglect if, the, if there's a religious reason. And I think there is no legitimate r religious reason to deny a child the right to life. And you cannot uh, tell a child, look, mommy and daddy don't believe in doctors, so you're going to die. Because 80% of these children, according to uh, research, would have survived if they had just had a visit to an emergency room or a doctor's office. And this was, this was completely avoidable, needless deaths that occurred. So there are a number of groups. Uh, another example would be Jehovah's Witnesses who routinely encouraged their, their members not to get a blood transfusion. And every year, Jehovah's Witnesses die because they have not gotten a blood trans, transfusion. Now, sometimes the courts have intervened and they have forced families to provide a, a blood transfusion for a minor child. But there are many women that are Jehovah's Witnesses that die uh, due to complications of, of bleeding in childbirth. And I think that's a tragedy. So uh, do, you, do you ever think we're going to not have cults in society? As long as there's money to be made and people that want power and control and sex and that they, they, they want all those things, there are going to be unscrupulous, uh, sociopathic, narcissistic leaders that are going to pop up and go for that. And, uh, I mean, that's just the way of the world. There have been destructive cults since the beginning of human history, and I think it's going to continue for the foreseeable future. The only thing I'm, I'm hoping more is that uh, law enforcement uh, and the authorities will hold groups accountable when they break the law. Because, you know, I think it's okay for people to believe whatever they want. You know, believe in the tooth fairy, believe in elves under your bed, uh, in the middle of the night, making campfires, whatever you want to believe in. But uh, if you do something in the name of those beliefs that is against the law, you do not have the right to do that. Uh, you have the right to believe whatever you want, but you cannot do whatever you wish in the name of those beliefs. And I think that looking at destructive cults, it's not about their beliefs, it's about their behavior. Uh, and when they break the law, I think they should be held accountable. And I think there, there needs to be more of that, because there are a lot of groups that are just plain lawless, and they do whatever they wish, and they think that uh, God or a higher power has given them a pass, and that they aren't accountable. So what do you hope people get out of your book after they read it? Well, I think they'll get a sense of the history of cults because there are chapters on uh, growing cult awareness, small but deadly family cults, and they'll really understand that this is, there's really quite a few groups that they may not have even heard of in addition to the more famous ones that are also included in the book. And then I think that the book helps people to understand what the uh, moving components are in the machinery behind the curtain. It's like watching The Wizard of Oz when you read the book. The curtain is pulled back and you see this little old man running the machine. And I think what the book enables people to do is understand the machinations of cults, how they really work, how people actually get trapped in them, and, and how they are deceived, tricked by these groups, and um, how they can get out of them. I, I think that the chapters on intervention, assessment, preparation for an intervention, really give people a clear, uh, concise, with more than a thousand research footnotes, understanding of that process of intervention that I've done for so many years. Now, do you have a website or a place that people can find you? Yes, uh, and anyone can uh, come to culteducation.com. And that is the home page, the entry point for the Cult Education Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit member of the American Library Association. And you can see the 
huge archives that are constantly under construction since 1996, and it's free. There's also a message board uh, attached to culteducation.com, which has uh, more than 150,000 entries from former cult members and concerned people who are trying to help the public understand all these groups out there that you've never heard of. Fantastic. Now, we'll have your book as well as your website posted on ours so people can just go one click when they are listening. Again, the book Cults Inside Out, and the author was our guest, Rick Allen Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This is a production of Something Wave Media.